Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Today is July 27th, 2022, and it is the Kraken episode number 232 with Riel reporting. Thank you so much for joining us today, whether you're listening with the audio files or watching on a streaming platform. Today's episode won't be as thematic as previous reports, but today the breakdown will be about eight stories from North America, a few miscellaneous global stories, um, some updates on the global energy crisis, some technocratic geopolitical updates, and we're going to end the segment today on some heavy focus with Russia, Ukraine. So without further ado, let's get into it. Allow me to share my screen here. Okay, right on. So first up, we have the Pope apologizes for the evil of Canada's residential schools. This is from Al Jazeera. On Canada visit, Pope Francis asks Indigenous people for forgiveness for church members' role in catastrophic system. Interesting, right off the bat, we see him in a wheelchair. Um, don't really know what that means about his health, but we can only assume that it has to do with his age. So Pope Francis has apologized to Indigenous people in Canada for the evil of residential schools, the church-run forced assimilation institutions that First Nation, Inuit, and Métis children were forced to attend for decades. So this topic on its own is a very deep, disturbing topic. It's very interesting to see the timing of this occur right now with the Pope visiting Canada. Uh, because I am from Canada and I do have Indigenous blood, uh, I've paid very close attention to a lot of this uh, story, and we will definitely be doing our own deep dive into that segment, but not today on the Kraken. Uh, we also have another story to continue on, is that uh, that was from July uh, 24th, and this is more recent about the, Pope about the Pope visiting Quebec City for the final days of his Indigenous reconciliation visit. So that's from today, July 27th. Um, and of course, this is a very big deal for the people of Canada, uh, whether you're Catholic, Christian, a Jewish, Muslim, it's, it's a very significant gesture at the very least, that the Pope is visiting Canada to apologize for the atrocities that the Catholic Church and the Canadian government were deliberately involved with. And again, we won't go into the details here, but uh, we will definitely be doing that later on in the Generation Z episodes. So next up, we have Hockey Canada has paid $7.6 million in sex abuse settlements since 1989. Wow. So Hockey Canada has says it's paid out $7.6 in nine settlements related to sexual assault and sexual abuse claims since 1989, with $6.8 of that related to serial abuser Graham Jones. So the go hockey governing body has been under fire since it was since it was revealed the money in its multi-million dollar national equity fund, which had been reserved for uninsured payments, including sexual assault and sexual abuse claims, came, comes from player fees. So this is another story that's uh, very important in the Canadian landscape of things because even when you try to get away from all of the dis uh, all of the uh, terrible things going on in the world, and you just want to focus on some sports to turn your mind off. Well, here you have it: the world of sports in the junior level, specifically in hockey, is rife with unfortunately sex abuse, and much like a lot of other sports around the world from the gymnastics world of America we found out about recently. It's it's very disturbing and stay tuned for uh, what ends up coming as a result of these investigations. Next up, uh, here are some key takeaways from former President Trump's speech in Washington. This is from Al Jazeera. So Donald Trump just gave a speech in Washington. And during his speech at the America First Policy Institute, Trump hinted at a 2024 run, repeated unfounded claims of election fraud, and re-upped themes from past campaigns. So very interesting, and we're not going to go deep into what he was saying at this event, but I want to bring our attention to the America First Policy Institute. If you recall 
on a previous episode we did, we looked at how uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have their Build Back Better policy or Build Back Better Institute. So you've got this nationalist faction that Trump seems to be representing, and then you have the globalist faction that Biden seems to be representing. I'm not going to say which one we should, you know, well, I won't even go there. Um, just keep that in mind that the idea of nationalist factions and globalist factions, and we have them right here in their own uh, policy institutions. Next up, uh, we have, now this is actually one of the most interesting stories of that, that we'll be reporting on today. And I, I'm personally actually a little confused about what this means. So the US defense chief says militaries should be civilian controlled. Lloyd Austin says democracy deepens security while at meeting in Brazil, where President Jair Bolsonaro seeks re-election. So from July 26th, U.S. President Joe Biden's defense secretary, Lloyd Austin, speaking at an America's-wide defense conference in Brazil, where military loyalty to the Constitution has become a central issue ahead of the October 2nd presidential election, said militaries should be under civilian control. And Austin, who is a retired U.S. Army general, made the comment on Tuesday. His quote is that credible deterrence demands military and security forces that are ready, capable, and under firm civilian control, adding, the more we deepen our democracies, the more we deepen our security. And his remarks came just two days after Brazilian president formally launched his re-election bid by saying, now, the Brazilian president, Jair Bolsonaro, is quoted as saying, the army is on our side. And I simply want to bring this to our attention as Donald Trump just made a speech in Washington for the first time in, in, a, in a while. And Bolsonaro is another one of these characters who's considered a nationalist, arguably against the globalist agenda. So just interesting timing to be monitoring here. Next up, we have... Uh, Alex Jones, the most dangerous type of attack denier. So uh, this article is explaining the detective who led the investigation into the 2012 Sandy Hook Elementary School attack testified Tuesday that there are three types of people who deny that it happened and harass the victim's families, the mentally ill, those who believed bad or incomplete information, and those who knew the truth but twisted it for their own power or money. So essentially this is saying that uh, there's an ongoing trial right now to determine how guilty Alex Jones is for allegedly having denied the uh, Sandy Hook uh, shooting and called it a conspiracy. So uh, this is an interesting one. Um, and again, the timing of him having this trial at the same time as Bolsonaro and Trump um, well, it just uh, very interesting. And of course, this is YouTube, uh, public video. We're not going to go into this one. Not going to say one way or the other, but uh, just keep in mind and join us for our uh, Patreon segments where we can go deeper into this uh, a little more unfiltered. Next up from the United States is that, oh, let's see, Senate passes bipartisan bill investing $52 billion in U.S. semiconductor production. So the Senate voted Wednesday to pass a long-awaited bill aimed at boosting U.S. semiconductor production in a bid to increase American competitiveness. The measure now goes to the House for approval before it can be sent to President Joe Biden for his expected signature. So there is a semiconductor chip shortage, and the uh, United States of America wants to rely less on other countries like China for manufacturing. Fair enough. That seems like a smart thing to do for any country. Moving on. <laughs> I can't help but laugh. I'm sorry, but emerging from isolation, Biden urges Americans to get COVID-19 shots. Okay. So the U.S. President Joe Biden ended his COVID-19 isolation on Wednesday, telling Americans they can live without fear of the pandemic if they take advantage of booster shots and treatments, the protections he credited with his swift recovery. He's quoted as saying, you don't need to be president to get these tools to be used for your defense. In fact, 
the same booster shots, the same at-home test, the same treatment that I got is available to you. Get boosted, get tested, and get treatment. Right. Uh-huh. Well, all right, we're just going to move on from there. And on that same tangent, but not on the same tangent, so read between the lines, please, as we do the reporting here. Ontario Hospital Network mourns the loss of three doctors who died within a week. Dr. Stephen McKenzie, Dr. Lorne Segal, and Dr. Jacob Sawicki. It is with so they are quoted as saying, "It is with deep sadness that Trillium Health Partners mourns the loss of three of our physicians who who recently passed away." And their the spokespeople are quoted as saying, "The rumor circulating on social media is simply not true. The passings were not related to the COVID nineteen vaccine." Yeah. Um, well, we're just going to end that there and go on to the next story. This is about the United Kingdom, where uh, Rushi Sunak and Liz Truss, who are running to replace PM Boris Johnson, were debating when a crashing sound was heard. So the debate was abandoned after host faints. A televised debate between the candidates to become the United Kingdom's next prime minister has been abandoned after the host fainted on air. And the camera was on Truss, who flinched and said, oh, my God, before the transmission was cut. So I am putting this story in succession with the previous one because you can use your imagination. I'm sure that our audience has seen those compilations of nurses and other athletic professionals or amateurs collapsing when of course we know it has nothing to do with the vaccines. Next up, uh, Italy's president dissolves parliament, triggering snap election following Draghi's resignation. So this is from July 21st. Italy's president Sergio Mattarella dissolved parliament on Thursday, triggering a snap election following the resignation of the country's prime minister Mario Draghi earlier on in the day. So I know last crack and I reported on is that he said he was not going to resign because it's what the people wanted. The people wanted him to stay in power. And well, shortly thereafter, um, the president branded the developments as inevitable following the political upheaval faced by the European Union's third largest economy over those past 24 hours. Um, right. So it is a, another leader that has resigned interesting and of course reminder that he was a european central bank former european central bank chief right and he oh he worked closely with the finance minister danielle franco to prepare reforms plan, to prepare a reforms plan for italy that will allow it to obtain a 209 billion euro package from the european covid-19 recovery fund however last week the five star political party withdrew its support in a parliamentary confidence vote on an economic package designed to tackle Italy's cost of living crisis. Right. So interesting. We'll see what it goes on there. And of course, our uh, dear friend and host of Generation Z, the founder of the program, uh, this this community uh, is, is from Italy. So when he is uh, able to make some comments, I'm sure we'll get some fascinating commentary from him which he will be returning very soon. Uh, next up, we've just got uh, two kind of random global stories, but I personally do find them uh, relevant. Uh, first one up is toxic liquor kills dozens in India's dry state of Gujarat. 10 more people die in the Western state, taking the toll in the incident to 38, officials have said. So at least 10 more people have died in India's Western state of Gujarat after having drunk spurious liquor. Now, the, uh, I mean, of course, this is awful when it happens. I'm sure that, uh, as they say, critics say the alcohol ban encourages peddling of illegal and often tainted liquor that is brewed without regulation. So there's the debate that regulating the alcohol, making it legal, would prevent these things from happening. Um, but what is 
interesting that I wanted to find in this article to bring up. Let's see if I can bring that here. Um, maybe this isn't the same article I was looking at. My apologies, folks. But essentially, this is actually uh, the same state where Dorindra, the, the prime minister of India, is from. So that is what I wanted to bring to our attention. Oh, here it is. So the manufacture, consumption, and sale of alcohol are banned in Gujarat, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's home state. There are some government authorized liquor shops where residents with special health permits and foreigners can buy alcohol. I wonder what sort of health permit you need to buy alcohol, but that's just interesting with Narendra Modi's home state where this is happening in because of the geopolitical ramifications of things that India does given its involvement with the BRICS alliance and uh, the BRICS versus the West um, battle of world orders going on right now. Next up, we have Japan executes man over 2008 stabbing rampage. Now, this is under the category of death penalty in, Algier in Al Jazeera. So this was uh, shocking to me, actually. I did not know that Japan would commit capital punishment. So Japan has executed a man convicted of killing seven people in a stabbing rampage in Tokyo's popular Akihabara, uh, Akihabara Electronics District in 2008. So this is very surprising, um, given especially what has recently happened with the assassination of Shinzo Abe in Japan. Um, yeah, just very interesting and shocking uh, violence in that country. Um, so now we're going to get, uh, going to be getting into kind of the, the heavier and more specifically themed content that we've been trying to keep up with on the Kraken. So first up, uh, this is from CBC. Now this isn't quite a news report, but it is still on their website and it is, uh, from their investigative journalism. And the headline for this one is in Xinjiang, China. Surveillance technology is used to help the state control its citizens. And the headline says, we should be wary of the government exporting this technology to other countries, says the documentary filmmaker. So to be honest, this does give me some uh, goosebumps to, to read it because this is essentially one of the foundations of the technocratic biosurveillance state uh, that we are seeing and that the pandemic has essentially ushered in to the world. So to see this on CBC, actually, um, I'm happy with, uh, and I'm proud that they're talking about this. Um, and I just want to highlight one passage from this article saying that uh, Barnwell, uh, one of the experts talk, uh, mentioned in this, uh, he believes the extent of Xinjiang surveillance has implications for the rest of the world. Chinese companies are engaged in an aggressive export program worldwide, he says, in an effort to dominate the AI industry, which was valued at more than 20 billion US in 2018 and is rapidly growing. Chinese tech companies have already provided artificial intelligence-based mass surveillance systems to at least 18 countries, which have poor human rights records. Watch how this technology could be used to limit freedom. Okay, like now that's as deep as I'm going to go here, because on our Patreon side with the Dose of Reality program, we're going deep into that topic. And yes, so keep now... I'm just going to share this next story and let's, okay. So they didn't take it down. So I'm glad about that. Um, and now this is from nine years ago. I'm not going to play the clip. I'm just simply showing you that this is a CBC story that the liberal leader, Justin Trudeau's remarks about his admiration for China's basic dictatorship has offended some Asian Canadians. So in this clip from nine years ago, Justin Trudeau, Justin Trudeau current prime minister of Canada says that he envies China's basic dictatorship because that is how they get stuff done, essentially. And yeah, we're just going to leave that there. And we're going to move on to the next segment. So on the same tangent of China and more focused on the CCP, not the citizens of China, when, all, when we do all of our reporting, we're not focusing on the citizens because as we know, the 
citizens are the ones who are generally the innocent ones who suffer, whereas the uh, politicians, the business, the corporate world, the elite essentially uh, get to do whatever they want. And yeah, but so here is China's Alibaba eyes dual primary listing in Hong Kong. Move would see Alibaba become the first large company with primary listings in both New York and Hong Kong. Now, that's a very fascinating geopolitical move because um, the move announced on Tuesday would see Alibaba become the first large dual primary listed company on the New York Stock Exchange and Hong Kong Stock Exchange, taking advantage of a new rule allowing dual primary listing. Um, Right. So this has many, many implications from the intelligence side of things to the business side of things to the political side of things. And yeah, of course, uh, we see that uh, uh, the e-commerce giant saw its stock price plummet after Beijing launched a sweeping crackdown on private industry that left the company with a $2.8 billion fine and its affiliate ANT ant. So interesting developments there. Next up, now we're going into, this is more the uh, energy sector side of things slash Agenda 2030 relevant stories. Now, this is going to be very fascinating for you all. So please pay close attention. <laughs> uh, Asia goes nuclear as climate and Ukraine banish memory of Fukushima. China, Japan, South Korea, India, and Pakistan are betting on nuclear power amid climate crisis, energy security fears. So this is um, simply highlighting that from China to South Korea and Japan, Asian countries are rushing back to the low carbon energy source as an accelerating climate crisis, soaring energy prices, and energy security concerns eclipse previous safety fears. So... Also very interesting that this is happening right after Shinzo Abe was assassinated, but Japan is restarting nuclear plants that, that have been idle since the 2011 disaster. Uh, that the current prime minister is pledging to get at least nine reactors up and running by the Northern winter to meet the country's growing energy needs. Um, now, this is uh, just a very interesting development with where we're going with the 2030 uh, Sustainable Development Goals um, and the controversial topic of nuclear energy. Um, this is a very fascinating ar article in itself. Uh, this is from Al Jazeera, where Asia goes nuclear as climate Ukraine banished memory. Uh, feel free to look it up on yourself. Um, but I think that this is very fascinating because there's a lot of debate in the nuclear energy world about uh, how sustainable it is, how safe it is, what we've been told about it versus what the reality is. So it's interesting to see the Asian countries push forward here. Okay, uh, next up is from July 26th, the, the Associated Press on CTV News is that biz, um, developing nations seek to overcome energy currency crisis. Business leaders and officials from eight developing nations meeting in Bangladesh on Tuesday said more co cooperation was needed among them to overcome dwindling foreign currency reserves, a growing energy crisis, and supply chain disruptions. So representatives from Egypt, Iran, Malaysia, Nigeria, Pakistan, Turkey, and Bangladesh, un under the banner of D8, or developing eight countries, were discussing alternative trade financing such as cross-currency swap, barter, and blockchain to address their foreign currency reserves vulnerabilities, according to the organizers. Interesting. So there we see uh, uh, these other countries who arguably, like uh, uh, Egypt and Iran, have obvious interest in the BRICS alliance, same with Nigeria, same with Turkey. Um, so just fascinating to see what is going on in the developing nations side of things for, in terms of the uh, world order geopolitics and the, uh, restructuring and reshaping of, of planetary affairs. Now, next up, we have EU ministers. So the European Union ministers agree on gas cuts plan as Gazprom tightens squeeze. 
So the member states are looking to mitigate the effect of a Russian squeeze on gas flows before the winter season. The European Union energy ministers have reached an agreement on an energy proposal requiring member states to cut their gas use by 15% from August to March in the face of concerns about the reliability of Russian supplies in the coming winter. And this we're going to reference uh, a couple of weeks ago when we talked about how France and Germany are being told by their politicians that they have to start rationing their water and energy supplies in response to Russia cutting their energy in response to the sanctions that the West imposed on Russia. So, you know, it's almost like they're deliberately doing this to themselves. Yeah, that's all I'll say that about that. Next up, <laughs> we have Saudi Arabia plans a $1 trillion mirrored skyscraper in Neom. The mirrored skyscraper will run parallel for 120 kilometers and will house 5 million people, according to papers seen by the Wall Street Journal. Now, this is just absolutely wild. Um, is that Saudi Arabia is embarking on an ambitious plan to rebuild the world's largest structure in the northwest of the kingdom. The New Wall Street Journal uh, viewed a hundreds of pages of confidential planning documents that revealed for the first time the layout of the plan. The structure, known as the mirror line, will be comprised of two glass reflective building measuring buildings measuring up to 488 meters high, running parallel for 120 kilometers across coastal, mountain, and desert terrain. So this is just, this is insane a little bit. Massive. Uh, and I mean, I say insane in the sense of what a, an impressive project to be undertaking. But now here is where it gets very interesting. The structure is the epicenter of Crown Prince and de facto ruler Mohammed bin Salman's zero carbon smart city project called Neom, which will cost another $500 billion to build and is the size of the US state of Massachusetts. So, as I mentioned already, the, this story is about zero carbon smart city project called Neom. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Please pause and just look at this picture. Now, uh, this is where we're ending the story, is that Neom is owned by Saudi Arabia's Sovereign Wealth Fund and is part of a framework called Saudi Vision 2030, a plan that seeks to diversify Saudi Arabia's economy and reduce its dependence on oil. Right. So that's its own. We can go deep into this one, but we're just going to leave it here because this is a kraken. But I'm definitely keeping this article in my archives for my own personal research projects. Next up, Bangladesh seeks $4.5 billion IMF loan as Forex reserves shrink. Dhaka seeks funds for balance of payment and budgetary needs and for efforts to deal with climate change, the Daily Star reports. And right off the bat here, we have a picture of the IMF with uh, the planet and this little plant here that could be an acacia plant. I'm not too sure, but yeah. So uh, Bangladesh has sought a $4.5 billion loan from the International Monetary Fund, the country's leading newspaper reports, joining South Asian neighbors Pakistan and Sri Lanka in seeking help to cope with mounting pressure on their economies. Right, so we've already talked about uh, Sri Lanka and their IMF deals. Pakistan is coming up right now, actually, in our next story. But the, the emphasis is tying together our understanding of the implications of the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the United Nations, um, the World Health Organization, the CDC, all of these institutions are all so involved. And it's very important for us to understand these institutions on a macro scale so that as we move forward through this uh, transition between essentially the West to the East, we're not caught so off guard as we're trying to understand what's going on here. And again, I'm just giving you the very surface level explanations, but feel free to make your comments in the YouTube section and I will happily answer your questions and engage and we can have conversations about all of this. 
on a much deeper scale. So next up, we have millions in Pakistan without digital ID card, rights activists say. So activists say millions still lack the computerized national identity card as critics cite database breaches and privacy violations. And this is more of a, a this is a long story. It's not just so concise about uh, the, the details of it, but we're emphasizing that there is a computerized national identity card in Pakistan and only with your father's ID card, are you eligible to get one? Now, it's very interesting about why Pakistan would want to be doing this, but I'm tying this into the category of the geopolitics of Agenda 2030, because, well, as we already looked at with the story from uh, China and them exporting their surveillance state technology with Justin Trudeau admiring China's basic dictatorship, well, digital identification, if you have been paying attention at all during the pandemic over the past two and a half years or so, there's definitely a push. However, this, now just look at this headline here, living like aliens. Hmm. And I mean, I know it has more to do with immigration, but still that terminology is fascinating as we also are paying attention to the UFO slash UAP disclosure campaign that's going on. Whether or not it's a psychological operation campaign is up for us to decide, but we are simply just paying attention to what's going on here. So uh, just to continue with this Pakistan story is that the NADRA maintains the nation's biometric database and says it has issued some 120 million uh, CNICs to 96% of the adults. So um, the National Database of Registration and Authority. So Pakistan is a country where they have, uh, each card compromises a 13 digit unique ID, a photograph of the person, their signature and a microchip that contains their iris scans and fingerprints. Right. So just going to say, just going to keep that there and we're going to move on to the next story. Here we have, uh, now this is, um, this is interesting, but it uh, was more of a miscellaneous story because I didn't really include our stories about what's going on in Africa for today. Uh, I'm going to be doing that more so tomorrow and Saturday, but the U.S. Senator favors ending aid to Rwanda over human rights abuses. So Kinshasa has accused Kigali of backing the M23 rebel group in the DRC's eastern region, which the latter denies. And I'm I'm getting, th this story is involved be, uh, with today's report because when we go more into the Russia side of things, remember this story. So this one, the highlight here is that the chairman of the United States Senate Committee on Foreign Relations said he would place a hold on U.S. security assistance to Rwanda in Congress over concerns about the Rwandan government's human rights record and role in the conflict in the neighboring Democratic Republic of the Congo. In a letter to the U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, Senator Robert Menendez called for a comprehensive review of American policy towards Rwanda. So keep that in mind, is that the human rights record and role in the conflict of the neighboring Democratic Republic of the Congo. So just keep that in mind as we continue on. So now here we're gonna, uh, you know what, actually, uh, I'm just gonna skip my cue here so that we're keeping the, the those stories. Um, so, okay, next up we have, Protesters demand the United Nation troops leave the Democratic Republic of Congo amid rising conflict. So the UN peacekeeping mission, MONUSCO, has come under regular criticism for its perceived inability to stop fighting in the conflict-torn East. This is from July 26th. So demonstrators have set fires and forced entry into the United Nations mission facilities in the Democratic Republic of the Congo's eastern city of Goma, demanding that the peacekeepers, peacekeeping forces leave the country amid rising insecurity in the region. Now, I, okay, so 
the whole reason this is very significant on a on a on a big scale here um we're seeing the there is less and less trust from the local people of certain countries where the united nations and western backed groups are intervening in and i'm just personally going to share a little bit of an opinion here was like i am relatively anti-interventionist and i do not think that the United Nations and these other countries should be getting involved with the affairs of other countries, especially that we've learned about Echo 127, which was a program that we learned of secret uh, military, paramilitary operations in 120, uh, 127 different operations around the world. Um, so, you know, so keep this in mind. You have the senator calling for a review of the United States involvement with Rwanda because of Rwanda's involvement in the Congo. And here we have anti-UN sentiment, anti-UN protesters in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now to the next story, we have at least 15 killed as anti-UN protesters spread in Eastern Democratic Congo. The UN chief says attack, UN chief says attacks any UN peacekeepers may constitute a war crime after three members of UN forces killed. So there's straight on lethal violence occurring right now between protesters in the Congo and the United Nations. But we have no idea without doing a much deeper dive who the protesters are, where their affiliations are, it could be this could be a proxy situation. This could be intelligence. This could be legitimate grassroots upheaval from the earthlings residing in the Congo because they're upset about the United Nations involvement there. And we do know of a lot of very bad stuff that UN peacekeepers have been involved with regarding sexual assault and other uh, things that we won't get into right here without the actual news stories in front of us. But when you pay attention to these things, you know, this isn't very surprising. Anyway, now this is tying into our final segment of the day. And thank you so much for, uh, you know, being with me and being with our community and sending your energy and giving us your attention. Um, we really appreciate it here at Generation Z. So Russia's Lavrov in Congo as Moscow courts Africa. This is from July 25th. So this is from the day before those other two stories came out about the violence in Congo relating to the anti-UN protests. Lavrov has already visited Egypt and will head to Uganda as Moscow aims at strengthening its ties with the continent. Now, Egypt, remember, Egypt is one of those countries that was part of the D8, the, the developing eight countries that are seeking uh, stronger ties with other developing nations to resolve the energy crisis. So Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has visited the Republic of the Congo, the second leg of an African tour aimed at strengthening Moscow's ties to the continent that has refused to join Western condemnation and sanctions over the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, suddenly, the plot thickens with the violence in Congo right now with the United Nations. There's so many things that could be the reason why that's going on there. but. Anyway, uh, I will just mention that in this article, we see that uh, Africa is also being courted by the West with French President Emmanuel Macron due to visit Cameroon, Benin, and Guinea-Bissau, and the U.S. Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa, Mike Hammer, on his way to Egypt and Ethiopia. So very fascinating here as we were trying to piece together these, uh, we're trying to put together these pieces of the geopolitical chess board and help understand why things are occurring. Okay, so now here is actually what I'm gonna do is, okay, so we're gonna end our segment on, we've got these last six stories all about uh, Russia and Ukraine here. So uh, what I'm gonna do actually is, uh, first off, we're gonna start at this is a way back from July 12th, and I have not covered the story yet, even though I've had it in my documents, just because it, uh, it kind of slipped my mind. But from Jerusalem Post, 
July 12th, Russia building new laser weapon to disable foreign satellites. So deep in the greater Caucasus mountain range, Russia is constructing a new laser weapon to be used for electro-optical warfare. Electro-optical warfare. Okay, so right off the bat, does that make you think of Havana syndrome? Does that make you think of anything else? But that is just the fascinating thing that I wanted to bring to our attention here. Can I exit that? Yeah, well, I can. Okay. So, and interesting to note that this was from an open source investigation published last week. So, you know, three weeks ago now, by now, by the Space Review. And this is construction of the Kalina project, which started in 2011, is underway in the Krona Space Surveillance Complex, located in the Chapal Mountain Peak. The report found by analyzing recent satellite imagery from Google Earth and documents from Russian industrial contractors. So the space security complex is a special quantum optical system to be used for electro optical warfare a Russian scientific and industrial corporation who was given the contract for the project by the Russian Defense Ministry. Very interesting here. Um, and, uh, okay, so that is a perfect segue into this next article here, where Russia to quit International Space Station after 2024. Roz because Roscosmos chief says space agency will focus on creating its own orbital outpost as its as it exits multilateral project. So very interesting. Um, Borisov, who was appointed by Putin earlier this month in a shakeup of the Russian Space Agency, said Russia would begin to form the proposed Russian orbital station, Ross, as it exits the multilateral endeavor at a time of high tensions between Moscow and the West over the former's invasion of Ukraine. Fascinating. Okay. And with these changes, yeah, very interesting. So, um, now on the other side of the Russia Ukrainian war, here we have from July 15th Ukraine's military in push to develop high tech army of drones. Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky, has appealed for drone nations to build up the military's aerial capabilities. Uh, and so this is an article where we're simply just reporting on the other side of things, that there's a lot of technological advancements that are going public now because of the Ukraine-Russian conflict. And I'm not saying that this is the first time that um, this technology has been used necessarily, but this is a perfect opportunity for the technology to be slowly disclosed to the public. Um, right. And yeah, so just interesting there. You've got the electro optical warfare on one side and you've got the drone nation on the other side. So what we're going to do here is, okay, go to Syria a close Russia ally breaks diplomatic ties with Ukraine. So the Syrian foreign ministry says its decision to break with Kiev was in accordance to the principle of reciprocity. This is from July 20th. So now uh, this is very fascinating because if we just reflect a little bit on the Syrian war from 2012, Barack Obama, the president of the US at the time tried to invade Syria but the president of Russia and the president of China actually vetoed that, asking to see evidence of Syria gassing its own people, which was the justification the United States wanted to use to invade Syria. And the United States could not provide such evidence. So it is pretty obvious to me why Syria would align with Russia and break diplomatic ties with Ukraine at this time. Not a surprise at all here. So on our last two stories, and we are gonna and uh, we're gonna look at this one from July nineteenth, where the United States hits out at Russia and China in their annual human trafficking report. The State Department cites Russia among worst offenders in human trafficking 
criticizes China's Belt and Road Initiative. So very interesting that they released a 634-page report covering policies on human trafficking around the world, including the United States, but both Russia and China are mentioned throughout the report as the two of the worst offenders. Um, other countries on the list include Afghanistan, Myanmar, Cuba, Eritrea, Iran, North Korea, South Sudan, Syria, Turkmenistan, and Yemen. Well, just on the surface here, I mean, this is a, I know I'm a little tongue tied about this because I'm trying to be selective with what I say, but the Yemen, you've got the, the conflict with Saudi Arabia and Yemen, Cuba, you've got the United States trying to go, trying to get involved with Cuba for a very long time, Eritrea, which is right beside Somalia, which is being used for uh, branches of uh, Al Qaeda, which is called Boko Haram. Iran, North Korea, obviously being used as proxies for global conflict. Clearly, Russia, Russia and Syria as well. Uh, Afghanistan, obviously. So as we see that the United States is accusing these countries and their governments of being involved in human trafficking, we really need to look into the ECHO 127 uh, document that we covered in one of the first Krakens I did that shows all of the black budget military programs that are stationed all over the world and how much of the CIA, the Western, the United Nations, the Western-backed organizations are involved in this human trafficking. So, you know, there's is very deep, uh, very deep stuff. Obviously, clearly human trafficking is the number one issue in the world. Um, it is the most valuable thing uh, humans are the most valuable product in the black market, as, as disturbing as that is, that's just the reality. But I find it very fascinating that the, the Department of State is using the Chinese-led Belt and Road Initiative of infrastructure projects as their main target with the human trafficking. And that's, you know, it's probably true. It is probably being used as a corridor for human trafficking, but it's just interesting how they're using that angle with things to say, like, no, 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 what China's doing is bad. Don't don't pay attention to what's going on in the U.S., but pay attention to what's going on in China over there. And, of course, the Chinese government uh, responds by saying, the Chinese government has achieved universally recognized progress in combating human trafficking, while the U.S. has a notorious record on this issue. If the U.S. wants to call out countries that engage in human trafficking, it should firstly point fingers at itself. Fair enough and well said. I think that's that is rational. Uh, but to say that it's not happening in China, though, that's that is just silly, um, and I'm definitely not saying that. And our last story for today is: Russia will help Ukrainians get rid of regime, says Lavrov. Moscow's top diplomat heightens rhetoric, saying President Vladimir Zelensky's government is anti-people and anti-historical. Sergei Lavrov, Russia's foreign minister, has said Moscow's ultimate goal in Ukraine is to topple the government of Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, an apparent pivot from the Kremlin's earlier stance. This is massive. I think that this is actually massive. And thank you so much if you've stuck around to listen to this final article, because, you know, this is this is this is it. This is actually what their intentions are. Um, however, we know that they've actually also said that as um, the Russian officials have already said that they want to denazify and demilitarize Ukraine and downplayed the prospect of overthrowing Zelensky's government back in February 24th. But here we have it, that uh, Russia is officially saying that they are going to try to topple the Ukrainian government. And... That is significant uh, mega news, in uh, my opinion. But that is it for today, uh, July 27th, 2022. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this report. And please feel free to comment. I really appreciate the support. Uh, we love the engagement here. And 
thank you so much for your attention and let's all continue to uh, make our waves shareable as a friend of the show, Dan Winter says. Have a great day. Talk to you all soon. Bye-bye.